Psalm 67. If you're there, would you say amen? All right, let's read this. I'll read verse 1. You got verse 2. And while you're reading it, I, I tell my little grandchildren sometime when they're reading to me a book, I say, what was, when they get done reading, I say, what was that about? I don't know. So uh, just stop and think about this as we read through it. Look at verse 1. God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us, Selah, that thy way may be known upon earth, thy saving health among all nations. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. O let the nations be glad and sing for joy, for thou shalt judge and, uh, the people righteously and govern the nations upon earth, Selah, <coughs> Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people praise thee. Then shall the earth yield her increase, and God, even our own God, shall bless us. God shall bless us, and all the ends of the earth shall fear Him. Now, with that being said, this is a great psalm. Leave your Bibles open for just a minute. And let's see if we can't get in and scratch out two or three truths to apply to us <clears throat> from this psalm living in this day. Let's pray. Father, would you bless the Word of God tonight? Thank you for the choir and Miss Brooke and uh, the good songs that we've heard, the privilege of being able to fellowship in church tonight and be together. And then I pray that you'd bless all of that's going on the other side of the building. Bless all that as well. And just help us now as we look at the Word of God together and remind us of some things as we live out these last days. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've been with us for quite a while now in our Wednesday evening services, we've been making our way through the Old Testament book of Psalms. We've been taking them one psalm at a time and then looking at and trying to apply the truths of the psalm to our own lives as we live out these last days. And of course, I think everybody in here can say amen when I say that we are living in the last days. And our journey through this great book brings us up tonight all the way to the 67th division or chapter of the book of Psalms. Now I've told you previously that the key to understanding most of these Psalms is hanging right by the front door of the Psalm. And what I mean by that is normally we kind of get an idea what the background or the setting was that prompted the writer to write that particular Psalms. And that all that's usually found right there in what we would call the superscription. But if you'll notice again in Psalm 67 as it was in Psalms chapter number 66, we're not really given any background information as to why this psalm was written. We're not even really told who the human author of this psalm is. Now we know the Holy Spirit is the heavenly author, the eternal author of all the Word of God. So we know behind it all, the Holy Spirit is the author of this psalm, but we're not told who the human vessel was that he used to write this psalm. But in my study, I found out most people agree that, uh, the, that King Hezekiah wrote Psalms chapter 67. Now what we're going to find out is, and if we ever get over there, in Psalms 120, uh, beginning in chapter 120, going through like Psalms 133, we're going to find out that there is a, all of those Psalms were written or either compiled by King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah was a great king. He was a godly king. And most people feel that he wrote the words of this particular Psalm. Most people think he wrote them right after God gave a, a great deliverance to Judah uh, from the captivity of the Assyrians. The Assyrians were the world superpower of that particular day. They had conquered much of the then known world and then they had carried off the northern kingdom, reached down, scooped them up and carried them off into captivity. Then King Sennacherib maneuvered his armies down upon the little nation of Judah. Their next move, their, their, their focus was to to conquer Judah as well. But although that may have been their plans, that was certainly not God's plans. They were encamped around about the walls, writing, writing threatening letters, uh, making accusations against what they felt like was an inferior God, 
only to find that a superior God destroyed their whole empire in basically just one night. In one night, God brought to its knees the world superpower of that day. And we read about that mighty move of God in three different books of our Bible. Second Kings, Second Chronicles, and then here's what Isaiah said about it in his, uh, in his book. The angel of the Lord went down and smote in the camp of the Assyrians, 104 score, 185,000 soldiers, and when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. So, I mean, their whole army, army basically was wiped out in one night. King Sennacherib then went back to his country and his own sons rose up and killed King Sennacherib. So, as we read this psalm, we can easily see how this would fit in to that particular situation. However, I can't say that for sure, but there are three things I can say about this psalm for sure by way of introduction. First of all, we know number one, Psalm 67 is a musical psalm. A musical psalm. Now, once again in the superscription, we read these words, to the chief musician on Niganoth. And that simply means stringed instruments. So the writer of this psalm wrote this psalm and then delivered it to the chief musician and said, okay, put the words of this psalm into music. You know, really the whole book of Psalms is is nothing more than a book of songs. Now, we call the book of Psalms uh, a book of prayers. And, of course, it has a lot of prayers from David or, in this case, as the case may be, Moses, uh, Asaph, Hezekiah, or some other writer. We know that most of the Psalms were actually prayers that they prayed. But then these prayers were put to music. In fact, some people refer to the book of Psalms as the Hebrew hymn book. Just like you and I, when we come to church uh, during our worship services, we sing from the church hymnal. Uh, Brother Brian will stand up and say, grab the red book, turn to this page, or grab that other book, turn to this page. And we all with one accord lift our voices and sing a song from the church hymn book. Well, the nation of Israel and light matter had their hymn book. But their hymn book's not the church hymnal. Their hymn book was the book of Psalms. Now, everybody in here has their favorite song or songs, as the case may be. All of us do. Uh, ask me what some of mine are. I know I got a top ten chart, and I, I got favorite songs and choir sings or favorite songs that different groups in our church may sing, songs that, uh, songs that speak to us and encourage us. In the secular world and in secular music, music they have what they refer to as the top 40 most popular songs or the top 40 countdown. And I guess what they do is compile the most requested songs for that particular week or however long it is, and then they compile a top 40 or top 30 or top 20, how many ever, uh, for that particular week. Well, we know in the book of Psalms there's 150 chapters, 150 songs in the Hebrew hymn book. Now, if you were to compile the top 40 of those 150 psalms, I'm sure that Psalms like Psalms 23, that would have to be up our top of the chart. Psalms 40, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit. I'd probably be up there in the top five or so. Psalms 100, talk about enter into its courts uh, with thanksgiving, and into its, into its gates with praise. Uh, boy, that'd have to be up there maybe in that top five or maybe Psalms 51 or some other one. The Psalms 1 or 2, uh, they would have to be in that top 40. But I got to tell you, I don't even think Psalms 67 would be in the top 40. I don't think it would make the top 40. In fact, I'll be honest with you. I don't even know if it would make the top 140 of the Hebrew hymn book. In fact, I'll tell you what I found out this week. Most commentaries don't even include this psalm in their commentary. So what I'm telling you tonight is made up. But, but with that being said, I'll tell you what. This is a great psalm. It may only have seven verses, and I counted them. You can sit behind me. There are 107 words in this psalm. But the one thing we know about it is a musical psalm. Number two, the second thing we know about this psalm is that many people think it is a millennial psalm. Now, what is a millennial? Well, you and I know that the millennial reign of Christ is going to be upon this earth after the great tribulation period. The Lord is going to come back from heaven. 
He, the Bible said that he's going to be riding on a white horse and the saints of heaven, the armies of heaven, that's you and me, are going to be following him down to fight the battle of Armageddon. And at the conclusion of the battle of Armageddon, Satan is going to be bound hand and foot. They're going to take him over, throw open somewhere on this earth. There is a, an opening to the bottomless pit and Satan is going to be slammed down into that bottomless pit and fall in a vacuum of fire for a thousand, thousand glorious years. We call that the millennial reign of Christ. Oh, it's going to be earth's golden age for a thousand years. Now, listen to me. Hear me and hear me well. This world ain't going nowhere for at least another thousand and seven years. Don't let the climate change people. I was shocked. Uh, uh, Austin Cavanus, WXI, one of our classes had him to come not long ago and uh, to speak to them just about weather in general. And I happened when he was leaving, I saw him walking out the front door. I, I ran out the door and I called up to him. And I was asking him, you know, that at that time I was still thinking it was going to be cold and all that stuff, which didn't really pan out. But shut up, we're not talking about that right now. Uh, but anyway, I was asking him, hey, you see it getting cold? Because the man I listened to kept talking about the man's going to get cold, snow's coming, whatever. And he said, no. He said, no, I'm not seeing that. And then I said, well, let me ask you a question. Do you believe in global warming. And Austin Cavanaugh, not Austin Cavanaugh, Brian Slocum. Austin Cavanaugh's not on there anymore. Brian Slocum said, absolutely, without a doubt, global warming is real. Now the global warming pundits will tell us that our earth if something don't change because of the leaks and the, and the holes in the atmosphere and the stratosphere that our world is in danger of, of, uh, of it, uh, and, and humanity is in danger of extinction. I got a good Hebrew word for that. Baloney. This world ain't going nowhere for another thousand and seven years. Seven year tribulation. If the Lord come today, we got a seven year tribulation. And boy, I'll tell you what. This crazy thing's going to burn up about it during that time. Two-thirds of the earth's going to burn up. One out of every two people is going to die in the tribulation period. But then we know there's got to be a thousand. So don't worry about it. Go burn a tire for Earth Day. We're going to be around here for a while. Can I have an amen? Don't worry about it. Use your spray-on deodorant. It don't matter. Whatever. Burn your trash. Who cares? It ain't going nowhere. Don't let this crowd scare you. Because there's got to be a millennial reign of Christ. And you talk about, you talk about a, a time of glorious, uh, 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 of a glorious change. During that millennial reign, things are definitely going to take a dramatic turn for the better. You know, when you read and piece together what the Bible has to say about that millennial reign, here's some of the statements that's made about the millennial reign. The knowledge of the Lord is going to cover the earth as the waters now cover the sea. I'll tell you what, our world ain't got a whole lot of the knowledge of the Lord anymore, does it? I mean, billboard signs and people riding around with crude and rude bumper sticker signs on their car. But during that day and age, I mean, everybody's going to be talking about the Lord. Ain't that going to be a good day? And you and I are going to be right in the middle of all that, ruling and reigning with Christ. In fact, there are some indications in the New Testament that the more faithful that we are in the day of grace, the more responsibility that we'll have in the time of the millennial reign of Christ. There are some parables that seem to indicate that the Lord will give those who are faithful more responsibility, maybe more, uh, more authority in the kingdom age than, than, uh, than you know, others may have that were less faithful. So it's going to be a great day, the knowledge of the Lord. The Bible said even the animal kingdom is going to be affected. The Bible said the wolf and the lamb will lay down together. Now you put a wolf and a lamb in a, in a pen today, there ain't going to be no, it's going to be lamb chops. But the animal kingdom is going to be so affected by the reign of Christ that they even will dwell. It'll go back to the days prior uh, to the days of, of the Garden of Eden when the earth was in, encapsulated by peace. And, and uh, boy, it was a time of greatness. And then what about this? Look down at verse. I can see easily how all this. Look at verse. Notice some of these verses here. Notice verse number three. Let the people praise thee, O God. Let all the people pray. That's going to happen during the millennial reign. 
Read, read on down here. Oh, let, verse 4, oh, let the nations be glad and sing, for, for thou shalt judge the people. The Lord is going to govern the world in that time. I can see that. Look at verse number uh, verse 6. Then shall the earth yield her increase, and God, even our God, shall bless. Did you know that during the millennial reign of Christ, things are going to so change for the better upon this earth that the Bible said that one man is going to go down the road planting seed, and the next guy's going to come right behind him harvesting crops. That's pretty quick. Now today, uh, I planted squash yesterday and, and zucchini and cucumbers. They have a 60-day yield. So 60 days from the time you plant, if you go from seed, normally in about 60 days, you should be getting squash, zucchini, cucumbers, whatever. Corn has a 90-day yield. So you plant it now, 1st of May, May, June, July, May, June, July. Probably going to get it around the 1st of August. has a 90-day. In the millennial rain, it'll be a one-day yield. You say, preacher, I don't believe that. Well, then look what the Bible said. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him that sow a seed, and the mountains shall drop down, and all the hills. Boy, I'll tell you what, it's going to be such a day and an age that even the whole earth is going to be affected. Some people say this is a musical psalm, and it is. And then some people say this is a millennial psalm, and it is. But then number three, some people say this is a missionary psalm. I, you can't help but notice as you read down through here how many times the Lord talks about all the people and all the nations. Look, if you will, again at verse number uh, 3. Let, let, let the people praise it. Let all the people praise it. Notice that, all the people. Uh, oh, let the nations be glad. And uh, verse number, let the people praise thee. Let all the people praise thee. And that kind of reminds me where it's talking about the, uh, uh, all the people. It reminds me of these verses right here. Go ye therefore. And, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son. We call that the Great Commission. And then after we do that, we teach them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, I'm with you all the way. Even to, so some people say musical psalm, millennial psalm, and then there are others who say this is a missionary psalm. And by the way, can I say this? God still loves the world. Can I have an amen? And God's command to the church is go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now let me tell you something about God and the world. And that is God has a love-hate relationship with the world. God hates the world and God loves the world. Now you say, preacher, explainify that one. I'm glad you ask. God tells us in the Bible that if we love the world, the love of the Father is not in us. The, God tells us in the Bible that if we're a friend of the world, we're at enmity, James 4, 4, we're at enmity with God. So in other words, God said, I hate the world. But then we got a verse, John three sixteen that says, for God so loved the world. Now, preacher, hold on just a minute. Does God hate the world or does God love the world? Yes. Yes. He hates it and he loves it. He hates the system of the world but aren't you glad he loves the sinners of the world? Everything about this world, the system of it, has been run by Satan. And it's geared to draw our attention and our affection away from him. Every bit of it is. God hates that part of it. But as far as the people who live in the world, God sure does love the sinners of the world. Can I say all sinners of the world? Can I say that God loves people on the African continent? And God loves people on the Asian continent. And God loves people on the South American continent. And God loves people on the, hallelujah, North American continent. And God loves people in Antarctica. Uh, you name it. God loves people. God loves the world. The sinners of the world. But here's what I want you to notice in this psalm. I'm coming in for a landing. I had to do all that to make this message last 10 minutes. That's how short this is. But the one thing I couldn't help but notice in verse 1, verse 6, and verse number 7, it talks about God blessing His people. Now, Miss Brooke just sang a moment ago that God is so good it's overwhelming. Did she not just sing that? We find in that, I guess I could title this psalm, God is so good it's overwhelming. God blessing His people. 
This ver look at verse 1. God be merciful and bless us. Look at verse 6. Then the earth shall yield her own grace. And God, even our God, shall bless. Verse 7. God shall bless us. Let's talk about God's blessings for a moment from this psalm. Now, blessings. Synonyms. The synonym game. What are some synonyms of blessing or to bless? It means to endow. It means to favor, to provide, or to bestow. So we could actually say this. God favors us with blessings. God, God endows us. He provides. He bestows upon us good things. Now all of us can stop and say, Well, preacher, we knew that before we come. Thank you for telling us. But I think we all can agree with that. God is good. Psalm 73, 1. God is good to Israel. Now I'm not of Israel, so I can't say amen right there. But I can on the rest of it where it says, even to such as are of an upright heart. Now I can get in on it. I'm not a Jew. Can you tell that? I'm Caucasian to the bone. I'm not a Jew. So I can't say, God's good to Israel. I can look at it and say, oh yeah, God's been good to them. Right, amen. But I tell you where I get in on it. It's when I receive Jesus. Jesus' blood made me righteous in the sight of God. And the Bible said he's also good to them that are upright in heart. You got in on that right there. God's good to us. God's been good to us. And so in this text, I give you three things and we'll go to the house. First of all, let me say number one, God's blessings grants us grace. God's blessings grants us grace. I'm playing on, I'm playing on the G's tonight. It grants His blessings, grant us grace. Now look at verse 1. God be merciful unto us and bless us and cause His face to shine upon us. Now reading that, I marry people. I marry more than I want to marry. And I bury more than I want to bury. But I marry people. And usually at the end of a marital ceremony, I say this. And I got it from the Bible. But here's what I say. Look at this right here. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give... I sound like a Lutheran when I say it, but I got it from the Bible. I mean, there it is. That verse kind of reminds me of those verses that I just read right there. Look at, break that apart. God be merciful unto us. Now we know this. We know God wants to bless His people. Uh, the writer, speaking about the nation of Israel, God wanted to bless the nation of Israel. The only problem was all too often their sin and their disobedience got in the way of God blessing them. God's plan was to bless the entire world through the nation of Israel. That's God's plan. Let me show you a verse. Genesis 22, verse 18. And, thy seed, and in thy seed, Abraham, Abraham and your boys and in, of your lineage, and out of your loins, the nation, it's my desire to bless the whole earth. And God desired in the Old Testament to bless the entire earth through the nation of Israel. But of course we know that they never really enjoyed the fullness of that blessing. Israel would not allow God to bless them. Instead of them being a blessing to the nation because of their sin and their disobedience and their rejection of the Lord Jesus, let me tell you something, instead of blessing the nation, they become a burden to the nations. You watch the news tonight. What's the top story outside of maybe some tragedy that's took place? What's the top story? We take you live to Jerusalem, to Tel Aviv. And Alan Costello is reporting live on the Hamas war. And I'm telling you, this world tonight is tore all to pieces because of that little 70-mile strip of land over there called the nation of Israel. Instead of a blessing to the world, they become a burden. You say, I don't believe that. The Bible said it. In that day, I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. They're a burden to the whole world. <laughs> I mean, how, many how much time does our president bless his heart? I'll oh, just forget about that. I ain't even going to say that. How many times have passed presidents in the past? How much time have they spent trying to broker peace in the Middle East? And the whole problem is the nation of Israel. You know what happened? God said, I want to bless you. I want to cause my face to shine upon you. But they, their, their sin, their disobedience stopped the blessings of God. And can I stop and say, our sin and our disobedience will cut off the blessings of God from our life. It'll, it'll cause God to, to
to, to, to cut the spigot of the blessing off in our lives. Notice what he prayed there in verse 1. God be merciful unto us. Mercy keeps us from getting what we deserve. Judah deserved a serious wrath, but God's mercy kept it from. How many times should you and I thank God daily that we don't get what we deserve? Mercy. Mercy keeps us from getting what we do deserves, deserve, and grace gives us what we don't deserve. That's it. Grace and mercy. And then he said this, cause your face to shine upon us. You know the expression of a person's face goes a, a long way. You know if you meet somebody or you have a meeting with somebody and you walk in and they've got a big smile on your face and you were a little bit worried about the meeting and you know they've got this, this glad look on their face, you kind of almost want to say, Phew, I believe everything's going to be all right. You got that from the expression of their face. Or if you have a meeting with somebody and you walk in and there's this somber, sad look on their face, you might want to say, uh-oh, this is not going to be. You learn that from the expression on their faces. Can I stop and interject this? I thought about it. I'm going to move on. But when you got to talk to somebody about something, and it could go either way, it's always better to talk to them in person than from behind the cell phone texting back and forward. I had somebody call me the other day and they were, they were upset at someone else and they had uh, had some words and they had swapped text and some emails and they called me and said, what do you think I ought to do? And I said, I think you ought to set up a meeting with that person face to face because a text, you can't see an expression on the face. A text or an email, you can't feel the emotions of the heart. And sometimes you may read that in a text or an email and you can't see the expression on their face and it kind of leads you to believe that something's there that was never intended to be there to start with. And we've lost the ability to communicate one-on-one, -on -one, person to person, face to face. And, and we got all the courage in the world to sit behind a computer screen, say anything we want to say, no matter how ugly or how rude it may be, that we wouldn't dare say to them if we was in a face-to-face -face meeting. We want God's face to shine upon us. Can I have an amen? When, when, you, when, when, when God looks down from heaven, is he smiling at you or is he frowning at you? Cause your face to shine upon us. God's, God's blessings grants us grace. Let me say number two, look again in this text, that God's blessings give us gladness. Look at verse number uh, four. Oh, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. Can I just stop and say there's two things sadly missing from the average life of the last day's Christians, gladness and joy. If I were to ask you how many people right now that you know have real joy in their life, and they're really glad that they're saved. Looking at some of your expressions tonight. Look at the, looking at the expression on your face. Are you glad? Do you have joy? Or is that something that is sadly missing from your life? Oh, I want to tell you, when you consider God's blessings, those blessings not only grant us grace, those blessings give us joy. Joy and gladness, something that is desperately lacking. How many nations, the, look at verse number four, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. How many nations do you know of right now that's glad and singing for joy? There is no national joy or gladness. What about this? How many, how many, how many churches do you know that are full of gladness and joy? Not many churches anymore that have gladness and joy. How many individuals do you know? that have gladness and joy. Let me tell you what the problem is. God is not in His rightful place. You know the reason our nation is in the, in, the, in the condition that it's in? God is not in His rightful place in this nation. And when God is out of place, there's no gladness or no joy. Let me tell you something. When God gets out, when we allow God, when we put God in a place other than what He desires in our life, joy walks right out the back door of our heart. That's right. You, you know what? I'll tell you one of the reasons why our nation's in such sad, sad shape. Look at this picture up here on the screen for just a minute. I don't know if you know what that is, and maybe you do, but that is a picture of the United Nations. The headquarters is in New York City. 
And in that United Nations, in the headquarters where all the nations of the world gather, the ambassadors, the, uh, uh, the representatives from the nations gather to make decisions for the whole earth. In the lobby of that great place, there is a statue to the Greek god Zeus, the god of thunder. But there's not one mention in that building of the living and the true God. Let me tell you why our nation, why our world is full of sadness and no gladness and misery and no joy. I'll tell you why. God's out of place. God's out of place. When God gets out of place in your life, there's no joy. There's no, there's no joy in Mudville. How many of y'all know where Mudville at? It's right over here off Jonestown Road. There's no joy in Mudville when God's not in His rightful place. And then churches today, no joy. God's out of place. And then in our individual lives, there's no joy or gladness. God is out of place. So number one, God's blessings grant us grace. God's blessings give us gladness. And then look down at verse 7. God's blessings gets Him glory. Look at verse 7. God shall bless us. God will bless the nation of Israel. God shall bless us. But notice the end result is this. And all the earth shall fear. You know why God blesses your life? So you can be a blessing. You know why God puts blessings on our life so He can get the glory? You know why God's so good to us? So we'll give Him the glory. And people will see that. And they will fear and trust in the Lord. That phrase there, uh, verse number 7, fear Him. That's New Testament way of saying they shall trust Him. And God blesses us so that we might in turn give Him glory and others around us can give Him glory. That's the only reason God blesses us, so He can get the glory. I wonder when's the last time you gave Him glory for His blessings upon your life. Well, thank you for listening. Hope you'll join us again in the morning at 9.30 for the broadcast. And I hope you have a good day. Until then, goodbye. God bless you. Let's pray.